Welcome back to the Farm Easy Tutor channel. My name is Ken Eto. Part four is the final segment of this lecture series on antibiotics. Today's discussion will be focused on the treatment of gram-negative organisms. I hope these talks are helping you to improve your knowledge of antibiotics. The next step is to apply what you've learned. It will take some time and a lot of practice to begin to feel comfortable making your antibiotic recommendations. Be on the lookout for a future lecture on the topic of antibiotic treatment of multidrug resistant organisms. And make sure to read the important disclaimer at the end of this video. Please continue to visit my site to learn more about drug therapy for different types of clinical disease states and topics. We've now arrived at part four of this four part lecture series. And in this section, we'll be talking about gram-negative organisms. Gram-negative bacilli represent the third group in the table of the bacterial spectrum. The gram-negative bacilli can be subdivided into three groups, the easy to hit, the moderate to hit, and the hard to hit gram-negatives. In the easy to hit gram-negative group, we have E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, and Proteus mirabilis. The moderate gram-negative bacilli group consists of Haemophilus influenza, Klebsiella oxytoca, Proteus vulgaris, Morganella morganae, Citrobacter coseri and ferundi, Providencia stewarti and retgeri, and Serratia marcescens. The hard-to-hit gram-negative bacilli include Enterobacter cloacae and aerogenes, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Acinetobacter calcoacidicus balmani complex, known as ABC. There's also a group of gram-negative cocci, which is small in number, but very important to mention and remember about. They include Neisseria meningitidis, Neisseria gonorrhea, and Moraxella catarellis. So we'll move on and talk more specifically about each of these bacteria. First, we'll talk about some of the characteristics of the gram-negative bacilli, and then we'll talk about the antibiotics that are used to treat them. The first subgroup of gram-negative bacilli are the easy-to-hit gram-negatives. This includes three species named E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, and Proteus mirabilis. Escherichia coli, or E. coli, is one of the most common organisms found in the environment. It's the most common cause of urinary tract infections. Now, in the past, E. coli has been very sensitive to most antibiotics. However, due to greater antibiotic exposure, it has started to develop greater resistance, especially to quinolones. Also, a higher level resistance to penicillins and cephalosporins is also increasing. This is called ESBL, and the percentage is increasing. We'll talk more about ESBL in a future lecture on multidrug resistant organisms. The other two bacteria, Klebsiella pneumoniae and Proteus mirabilis, is fairly easy to hit. However, Klebsiella is intrinsically resistant to ampicillin. As far as treatment, most of these bacteria can easily be killed with any cephalosporins, such as cefazolin or using once a day ceftriaxone. Alternatively, levofloxacin can be used with the exception of resistant E. coli. It's very important to check the antibi antibiogram in your area for appropriate sensitivities on which antibiotics are best to use against these bacteria. The second subgroup of gram-negative bacilli are the moderate to hit gram-negatives. These include a number of species that are listed in the table. Now, the moderate to hit gram-negatives require a little bit higher tier of antibiotic to kill it. However, most antibiotics can get to these species of gram-negative bacilli. Of note, Haemophilus influenza is a bacteria that usually coexists with strep pneumo in community-acquired pneumonia. Citrobacter diversus 
Coseri or Ferrandi is found in the urinary tract. However, resistance strains are emerging where the usual treatment of ceftriaxone may be questionable and it may need to be treated with quinolones. Most of these moderate to hit ground negatives can be killed with third generation cephalosporins uh, using once a day ceftriaxone or quinolones like levofloxacin. But again, make sure to check the antibiogram in your area for specific sensitivities of these bacteria. The third subgroup of gram-negative bacilli are the hard-to-hit gram-negatives, and it means just that. They're very hard to destroy. The first one is Enterobacter cloacae or aerogenes. This bacteria is an intestinal colonizer. Enterobacter has started to develop greater resistance, such that only four antibiotics are effective against it. Levofloxacin, cefepime, carbapenems, and piperacillin tazobactam. The second important hard-to-hit gram-negative bacilli is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, also abbreviated PSAERU. Pseudomonas is a healthcare-associated ICU-type pathogen. It likes most moist environments such as sinks, ventilators, and tubing, and respiratory devices, very similar to Legionella. It's the most common gram-negative bacterial cause of hospital-acquired pneumonia and ventilator-acquired pneumonia, HAP and VAP. Pseudomonas is particularly difficult to treat and a very worrisome organism in the hospital. Now, Piperacillin and Tazobactam, Cefepime, Septazidime, and some others are effective against treating Pseudomonas. And we'll talk more about specific treatment of Pseudomonas in a future slide. We wanna make sure that each area will needs to check the, their own individual antibiograms for sensitivities, because this, this can change geographically. The third hard to hit gram-negative bacilli is Acinetobacter calcoacidicus bombani complex, or ABC. Most strains of ABC are now extremely antibiotic resistant. It attacks the respiratory and urinary tracts in particular. It's less virulent than Pseudomonas aeruginosa. In the hospital, it can also be found on equipment such as sinks, ventilator tubing, and catheters. And ABC is normally found in water, food, soil, and sewage. Now the treatment of ABC is very difficult. You can use monotherapy or combinations of the following antibiotics, carbapenems, ampicillin sulbactam, colistin, and minocycline. So these are higher level antibiotics that are required to treat ABC. We need to make sure that we check the antibiogram for sensitivities against ABC before proceeding with the appropriate therapy. As far as ampicillin sulbactam, the sensitivity to ABC has to do more with the sulbactam component rather than ampicillin. Sulbactam is an enzyme inhibitor in unison that does have antibacterial activity. Against ABC, you need to use high doses of unison, three grams every four hours. So now let's talk about the antibiotics that are used to treat these gram-negative bacilli. Let's start off by talking about the penicillin group. In this group, we have ampicillin, ampicillin sulbactam, and piperacillin tazobactam. And if you notice, the sulbactam and the tazobactam are enzyme inhibitors. And these inhibitors allow the spectrum of these two antibiotics to be expanded in the gram-negative territory. You could see in the diagram that ampicillin sulbactam has both easy and moderate to hit gram-negative coverage, and piptazo has easy, moderate, and hard to hit coverage, including pseudomonal coverage. That plus there refers to pseudomonas coverage. 
Now, ampicillin is a good gram-positive coverage antibiotic. It hits strep, enterococcus, and listeria, as we mentioned in the previous episode of this series. It is getting weaker against E. coli. It only hits about 40% of E. coli. And as we mentioned earlier, ampicillin has no Klebsiella coverage. So it even has some questionable gram negative coverage against the easy to hit organisms. Ampicillin sulbactam has extended activity due to the enzyme inhibitor sulbactam. It does hit anaerobes, although it's not, no longer recommended for empiric treatment of intra-abdominal infections. And it has extended spectra into moderate to hit gram-negative organisms. As we mentioned earlier about acinetobacter, it is effective in, uh, in a certain percentage of uh, ABC against uh, ABC due to the sulbactam portion of ampicillin sulbactam. Piptazo has no MRSA coverage, but it does have very good intra-abdominal BFRAG coverage. It hits all gram negatives, including Pseudomonas, about 85% sensitivity. So it's a very broad spectrum antibiotic, but it tends to be overused as shotgun therapy, and this could induce resistance against Pseudomonas if it's overused. When we talk about carbapenems, there's ertapenem, and then there's the anisudomonal carbapenems, meropenem and imipenem. And you could see in the diagram, the spectrum is pretty good for both of these antibiotics. Gram-positive wise, it's, it's not very good, but definitely anaerobic wise, they're very effective against anaerobes such as B. fragg. And if you look at the gram-negative coverage, uh, it's very good, uh, with the exception of that ertapenem does not hit Pseudomonas. So when we talk about ertapenem specifically, it has very good anaerobic coverage. So it's good for GI surgical prophylaxis since you can give one dose preoperatively. And because of its long half-life, you have the post-op surgical prophylaxis period covered with one dose. However, Overusing ertapenem can be very detrimental in inducing resistance and make it not effective against ESBL. Uh, ESBL treatment, the drug of choice for ESBL is carbapenems. So we need to reserve ertapenem for that. It does hit the easy and moderate to hit gram-negative organisms, but not pseudomonas. Meropenem and imipenem, on the other hand, are anisudomonal carbapenems. They hit all gram-negative organisms, including pseudomonas, about 80% sensitivity. Meropenem tends to be better for seizure or meningitis patients. And the silostatin on imipenem is added to overcome the renal metabolism of imipenem by a renal dipeptidase. Within the cephalosporin family, there are eight antibiotics. So I made this chart to sort of sort things out. The numbers that you see on the left-hand column are the cephalosporin generations. The first generation cephalosporin is cephazolin. And this is the workhorse cephalosporin that has been used for many years. You can see that it has gram-positive coverage because it's used for MSSA. And cefazolin is frequently used for surgical prophylaxis because it does have effectiveness against staph aureus or skin infections. It doesn't have MRSA coverage. The second generation cephalosporins include cefoxetin and cefotitan, which are the only cephalosporins that have anaerobic coverage. These are primarily used for surgical pro prophylaxis now because they've been relegated to a lower status due to resistance occurring by B. Frag. Cefiroxime is an often forgotten 
respiratory antibiotic, but it's very good and it's also available in a tablet form. The third generation cephalosporins includes ceftriaxone and also cefotaxime. These are the workhorse third generation cephalosporins. Ceftriaxone is once a day, so it has a very good and easy administration compared to cefotaxime. Uh, they're good for meningitis, uh, but they are poor against pseudomonas and have no ABC coverage. So if you look at ceftriaxone or cefotaxime, they have good gram-positive coverage, not quite MRSA, but uh, good gram-positive coverage. Uh, they hit easy to moderate gram negatives. In fact, all of the cephalosporins, with the exception of cefazolin, hit the easy to moderate gram negative organisms. Ceftazidime really has no gram positive coverage, but you can see it mostly hits gram negatives. It has good pseudomonas coverage and it may hit light types of acinobacter or ABC, uh, although you do need to check your antibiograms for this. The fourth generation cephalosporin is cefepime, and this antibiotic is primarily gram-negative, and it does have better pseudomonas coverage than ceftazidime. It's a fourth generation cephalosporin. The fifth generation cephalosporin, ceftaroline, has is the only one that has MRSA coverage uh, has no anaerobic and no pseudomonas coverage. And it's good for mixed wound infections where you can have MRSA and other maybe some gram negatives with no pseudomonas uh, present. Now when we look at the table in a different way, we can see of the cephalosporins, the only cephalosporin that has gram positive MRSA coverage is ceftaroline with cefazolin and ceftriaxone having some other types of gram-positive coverage. Cefoxidin and cefotitin are the only uh, cephalosporins that have anaerobic coverage. The others do not have any. And the third column has to do with pseudomonas, where ceftazidime and cefepime are the only cephalosporins that have pseudomonal coverage. Now I added monobactams here because acetrionam is very similar in structure to ceftazidime. It's also very similar in terms of the coverage that it has. It's very similar to ceftazidime in that it only hits gram negatives um, and it hits all gram negatives including pseudomonas about the same degree as ceftazidime about 80% sensitivity. The advantage of using acetriunam is that it is a monobactam, and so you can use it against uh, pseudomonas or any type of gram negatives in penicillin allergic patients. When we talk about the quinolones, we need to first talk about the original quinolones that were introduced in the 1990s, levofloxacin and ciprofloxacin. Now levofloxacin has a slightly better gram positive coverage because it does hit strep pneumonia better than Cipro does. Cipro has an advantage over Levaquin in that it has slightly better gram-negative coverage against urinary tract infections. So levofloxacin is considered the respiratory quinolone because it does hit gram-positives like strep pneumonia and also atypicals very well. It doesn't hit b frag below the diaphragm anaerobes, and as you can see, as far as gram-negative coverage, it's becoming much less effective against certain easy-to-hit organisms such as E. coli and Proteus mirabilis. This is because over the years, we've used a lot of quinolones, and bacteria have developed resistance against them. Against Pseudomonas, resistance has occurred where it slowly declined to around 65% sensitive, and so we never use quinolones empirically when we're suspecting Pseudomonas aeruginosa. However, if the cultures come back sensitive to quinolones, then we can go ahead and order them. Ciprofloxacin is considered the urinary tract infection quinolone. It's very similar to levofloxacin in terms of sensitivity, 
slightly better than levofloxacin against urinary tract infections, but much less effective against respiratory illness. And again, the bottom footnote says quinolones are not to be used empirically for suspected pseudomonas, but used only when pseudomonas culture shows sensitive to quinolones. Okay, we'll move on to some other quinolones that became available after the other two. Moxifloxacin is considered or also known as the belly quinolone because it has it's the only quinolone that has anaerobic BFRAG coverage. However, because resistance against BFRAG has emerged, it should only be used for surgical prophylaxis. It is not to be used for urinary tract infections and pseudomonas use is questionable. Delafloxacin is the only quinolone that has MRSA coverage and is thought to be the superquinolone because it also has some pseudomonas coverage. It also hits Enterococcus faecalis. However, delafloxacin's coverage begins to fade as the only gram negatives it covers are E. coli, Klebsiella, Enterobacter, and Pseudomonas. It lacks coverage against strep pneumonia, atypicals, and anaerobes. And so maybe delafloxacin is not so super after all. When we look at the table as columns, we look at MRSA and the only antibiotic or only quinolone that's effective against MRSA is delafloxacin. Levofloxacin and moxifloxacin have also some good respiratory cat coverage, but no MRSA coverage. Moxifloxacin is the only quinolone that has anaerobic coverage. And as we mentioned, there are three antibiotics in the quinolone group that have pseudomonas coverage. However, they should only be used when cultures show that they are susceptible. The aminoglycosides, genomycin, tobramycin, and amikacin, have been used since the 1970s. However, recently, aminoglycoside use has declined substantially, primarily because clinicians are fearful of their nephrotoxic potential, as well as the advent of newer, safer antibiotics. When you look at the aminoglycoside spectra, you can easily see that it's focused primarily on gram-negative organisms. It has no gram-positive and no anaerobic activity. Genomycin, tobramycin, and amikacin all hit pseudomonas to various degrees, depending on your geographic location. Tobramycin tends to be more effective against pseudomonas than genomycin and amikacin may or may not be better than tobramycin. None of them hit ABC, although amikacin may have some activity against ABC or acinetobacter. Plazomycin is a new aminoglycoside, which does not have pseudomonas coverage, but it may have the potential to hit some more resistant gram negatives, but that's yet to be seen. As far as the tetracycline group, tigacycline is the key tetracycline to take a look at. Tigacycline has a very broad spectrum and it covers MRSA, anaerobes, and easy and moderate to hit gram negatives. However, it has no pseudomonas coverage and does not hit Proteus or Providencia. So we call this the three Ps. Proteus, Providencia, and Pseudomonas. It has no activity against these three Ps. It does hit atypical organisms. Now we talked about tigacycline in our MRSA section and noted that it is a good alternative to vancomycin for mixed wounds. Because of the rapid movement of tigacycline from blood to tissue, it has really not been successful in blood type infections such as sepsis. It has very low urine concentration, so it's not ideal for urinary tract infections. The other two tetracyclines are new, omatocycline and aravacycline. And each one of these has some degree of spectra related to tigacycline, omatocycline, 
hits MRSA, and aravacycline hits anaerobes. And so omatocycline is indicated for cap and skin and skin structure infections. Aravacycline is indicated for intraabdominal infections and complicated UTIs. Again, neither one of them will hit the three Ps, Proteus, Providencia, and Pseudomonas, but otherwise will kill any of the easy or moderate to hit gram negatives. So they do have extended spectra. The other tetracycline to talk about is doxycycline, which has good gram-positive coverage, as we've talked about before. It's good for community-acquired MRSA, and it has good atypical coverage. And uh, it only has easy-to-hit gram-negative coverage. Some other antibiotics that we use for gram-negative bacilli include colistin. Colistin is generally reserved for multidrug resistant organisms. Why? Because it has a high potential of causing nephrotoxicity and or neurotoxicity, so we need to limit its use. In certain cases of acinetobacter or ABC or multidrug resistant pseudomonas, we would need to resort to using colistin, but it is not considered a first line agent. Another antibiotic, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, has been used for many years. It has some gram positive coverage in that it is good for community acquired MRSA. It is not intended to be used for hospital acquired MRSA infections. It does have some easy to moderate gram negative coverage, although I have a question mark under easy to hit, which we'll talk about in a minute. Trimethylprim sulfamethoxazole is used for pneumocystis carinae infections, or PCP. The dosage is 15 to 20 milligram per kilogram of the trimethoprim component every 24 hours or every day. We give this in divided doses. Use caution in sulfa allergic patients because of the sulfamethoxazole component. Now, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole has some strep coverage and so we can use it in mild to moderate cases of COPD exacerbations. This antibiotic has been previously used for E. coli UTIs, but now it's only 60% effective. And so we generally will not use it as a first line agent for empiric therapy of UTIs, but wait until cultures come back. Let's talk about the empiric treatment of pseudomonas. Question, when do we treat a patient with antibiotics when we only suspect pseudomonas in a patient but have not yet documented it on culture? Patients at high risk for having a pseudomonal infection should be placed on empiric antibiotics upon admission to the hospital if their clinical condition warrants it. So here, the key words are high risk. So we'll define that on the next slide. So who are these high-risk candidates who need empiric pseudomonal coverage? Well, they're the same types of patients that we covered empirically for MRSA previously. They're the patients that come from nursing homes or extended care facilities who have been hospitalized for greater than 48 hours in the last 90 days, who have been previously on long courses of antibiotics, and for pseudomonas, patients who have tracheostomies, or have a history of multiple pneumonias. For these types of patients who are high risk, consider ordering antibiotics empirically for suspected pseudomonas, depending on their clinical status and the need for antibiotics. Now that we know which antibiotics are effective against pseudomonas, the next question is, what's the best approach for empiric treatment of pseudomonas? That is, if you had a suspected pseudomonal infection in which order would you use these antibiotics? The first group of antibiotics that I would consider are piperacillin tazobactam, septazidime, cefepime, and estreonam. 
if you had a coexisting intra-abdominal infection, then we should be using piperacillin tazobactam due to its anaerobic coverage. If no intra-abdominal process is going on, then we should be using ceftazidime or cefepime. And if the patient is penicillin allergic, then acetronam would be a good choice. The next level of antibiotics that we should be considering would be using carbapenems, such as meropenem or imipenem, or aminoglycosides, such as tobramycin and amin amicacin. If the patient can tolerate aminoglycosides, then we can use them. But if they're elderly or have renal dysfunction, then aminoglycosides should be avoided. The third group of antibiotics that we would consider would be colistin because of its neuro and nephrotoxicity. We need to hold back on it and use it in cases where the others fail to work or have been used in the past. Quinolones, as I mentioned, for Pseudomonas should only be used if the cultures and sensitivities show that they're effective against quinolones. We should never use quinolones empirically for suspected Pseudomonas. Finally, newer antibiotics have excellent Pseudomonas coverage. These are Zerbaxa, a combination of Septolozane and Tazobactam, and Recarbrio, which is a combination imipenem silostatin and relabactam. Both of these antibiotics have an enzyme inhibitor attached to the primary antibiotic that gives it excellent pseudomonas coverage. However, both of these antibiotics have a very high cost. It's very important to know all of these antibiotics and which antibiotics are used to treat pseudomonas. So please take a minute to review the list of antibiotic names. So we spent some time talking about the gram-negative bacilli, but let's not forget to mention the gram-negative cocci, which are also very important bacteria to discuss. There are three important gram-negative cocci to talk about. The first one is Neisseria meningitidis, which is also called meningococcus. It's one of the most common causes of bacterial meningitis, and many people carry the bacteria in their upper respiratory tract. The treatment of an active case of Neisseria meningitidis is to use ceftriaxone 2 grams every 12 hours. Alternatively, penicillin GK or meropenem can be used. In an active case, prophylaxis for exposure to this patient, you would use oral ciprofloxacin, or IM ceftriaxone. This will be for patients who have close personal contact with the patient with the meningitis. The next gram-negative cocci to discuss is Neisseria gonorrhea, also called gonococcus. Most gonococcal infections are asymptomatic and are self-resolving. These are infections that are acquired by sexual contact with an infected person. We use ceftriaxone 250 milligrams times one dose IM to treat it. Alternatively, high dose azithromycin one or two grams orally can be used. The third gram negative cocci is Moraxella or Branomella catarellis, often known as MCAT. MCAT causes ear and respiratory infections. It's the second most common bacterial cause of COPD exacerbations after Haemophilus influenza. We can treat Moraxella catarellus with amoxicillin clavulinate or augmentin or an oral cephalosporin, either second or third generation, or Bactrim. Alternatively, macrolides or doxycycline can be used. I wanted to spend some time discussing the so-called oddball bacteria, which you may encounter in your practice. The first group are what I call colonizers, and this includes a bacteria named Stenotrophomonas or Xanthomonas maltophilia. More often than not, this bacteria tends to colonize the respiratory tract rather than cause true invasive disease. However, 
It does have the potential to cause sepsis, pneumonia, and wound infections. It's associated with ventilators, tracheostomies, and prolonged antibiotic use. When you do get a culture for Stenotrophomonas maltophilia, it's very important for you to determine whether this is just colonization or if it's a true infection. Most times it's just colonization requiring no treatment. However, if it happens to be a true infection, the drug of choice is trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole or Bactrim, 15 to 20 milligram per kilogram per day of the trimethoprim component in divided doses. Alternatively, we can use quinolones or IV minocycline. This bacteria is uniformly resistant to carbapenems. Another colonizer is named Burkholderia or Pseudomonas cepacea. This bacteria also tends to colonize the respiratory tract rather than cause invasive disease. It is commonly found in cystic fibrosis patients. Again, if treatment is needed, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is used and alternatively, ciprofloxacin or merum. The second group of oddball bacteria occur in the GI tract, and these include bacteria named Salmonella and Shigella. The Salmonella species cause gastroenteritis that's related to the contamination of chickens and eggs. This is usually a self-limiting infection, and we just treat it by replacing fluids and electrolytes. However, if you have a high-risk patient such as someone who is immunocompromised, we might need to give quinolone such as ciprofloxacin or alternatively azithromycin. Salmonella typhi is slightly different in that it is transmitted by contaminated food or water. We treat this similarly with cipro or zithromax. Shigella is a common cause of diarrheal disease. It is spread person to person, most often by food service workers. Most of the illnesses are self-limiting. However, if treatment is needed, especially in high-risk patients, we can give quinolones or azithromycin. We have completed discussing the material and antibiotics, so now let's put it all together. From an antibiotic perspective, take each antibiotic and know what it covers from the three main categories, gram-positive anaerobes and gram-negatives. Know the names of all the antibiotics that hit MRSA, BFRAG, and Pseudomonas, and for each category, what are the preferred agents. From a disease perspective, know which antibiotic is the drug of choice for each disease state that we discussed and what the alternatives are. This is not an easy task, and it will take a lot of practice and real-world application in order for you to really feel comfortable assessing patients and making recommendations. But keep working at it, and I'm sure you'll soon become more confident, see the benefits, and achieve good results. Throughout this lecture, I referred to the antibiotics by their generic names. For your reference, I added the trade names to this complete list of currently available IV antibiotics. Congratulations! You successfully completed part four of four parts. You're done completing this antibiotic competency. And look what you finally did to Mr. Bacterium. We've got a lot in store at the Farm Easy Tutor channel. There will be upcoming talks on cardiac vasoactive drips, pharmacokinetic dosing, treatment of multidrug resistant organisms, TPN, and much, much more. So please stay tuned to us. Please take a moment to read the important disclaimer on the next slide. Thanks for tuning in to watch this episode of the Farm Easy Tutor. I hope you learned something that you could use in practice or at school. There was a lot of material presented and it does take time to study all the information. If you would like to continue to see more of these types of tutorials on YouTube and to stay informed when the latest material is available to view, please make sure to click on the subscribe button below. Stay tuned to the Farm Easy Tutor channel for more lectures in the upcoming weeks. So until next time, remember to take it easy.